BTWRLM 180. Yeah, there's some silence here, building up the tension. You heard it on Ron Stevens' broadcast on UCY TV during his uh, Rock the Boat segment. Soylent jerky crickets. That's all y'all that don't step up. It's all of us that don't step up, and maybe those that step up. This um, ongoing view I have about how we are not doing the correct thing that we need to be doing. Um, whether we've given up or whatever, I don't know about all that. We just we don't have the right to give up in some regard, unless you are agreeing uh, to those that are going to occupy you. Uh, I didn't make that rule up. You know, this is like a, a big violation to my psyche and my spirit, and what I was brought up to be. And so that's the other disadvantage. Those of us that are brought up to be peaceful and wanting to get along in the world uh, ran up against this uh, concentrated evil, And then the minions. And, and yes, they're represented as these little yellow things. Okay? They're, they're, that, they're little Twinkies with the glasses. Uh, they're not that hard to defeat. But we, but we have to understand, stop allowing them to make transparent their uh, work and uh, stop allowing uh, ourselves to talk ourselves out of being active in the proper way. Remember, I don't know what, what I'm really not, not sure what, how to convey this and, and also not uh, either have people dis, disregard it or just uh, feel maybe attacked. We, we don't have the right to not do something. We don't have the right to give up unless we agree with the criminal that's coming against us. It's pretty simple. And I didn't understand that this was going to be really, I mean, it's okay, so call me naive. All right, I'm naive. I, I expected the world that was peaceful and we would all get along. Kumbaya. The real one, not the one they're foisting on us. Not the one that comes by the terms. Uh, the warm and fuzzies that are what we find is what Orwell predicted or he's told us because he maybe been inside the plan that says, you know, you better watch your vocabulary. They can turn any word inside out and get you to believe it and then control what you how you go about world and then they make it so uh, well in a view it looks like it's overwhelming and you most of us just give up and, and I, I can hear that in lots of people and so then we make justifications about how we're going to oh we're going to talk about the fight but we won't get into it and that just seems to be also nature if I, I almost said human, you know, but, you know, it just are so easy to say these words, but they actually have some meaning that we, we put, start attaching the work that we do to try and straighten our vocabulary up is, is the proof that you live in a condition that's being brought up around you that you have to resist. So to me, it's an on, you know, I've told you, I've proved it. It's an ongoing crime in the, in, in the statutes. It's a, whether or not that comes from the source of the people or from the interloper, it's a crime what's going on. But, but it's a crime on these multiple levels. You know, I could, I could, I thought about a long time ago, let's go off and I could do the Bible thing. I could do the spiritual thing. I could do the New Age talk and try and swing people from the New Age uselessness into something good. And I said, that's all just, a, that's just, just as much a diversion. I, I made a choice, uh, folks. I keep telling you all that there's a way to do it in the legal. And I haven't a, completely abandoned that option. I decided a long time ago uh, that I saw what legal was. There are tools in the legal sphere, in the sphere of fiction, the tools that allow this thing to work on the good side that you should take note of that are the ones you con condemn in the, the so-called elites that understood this and understand this. Uh, those tools are available to you too. What I noticed though, at the time I'm looking to set something up for myself, a couple decades ago, was I noticed that there was this little, little glitch that I knew I could uh, walk into the fiction and I could start to do what I could figure out to do to get ahead through it, and you can, and there's lots of advantages, and you have to learn to do it right, like anything. But I also noticed there was this thing that was uh, the flesh and blood in me, me. 
and, and any man or woman that is listening to me or their offspring. And we started, then I started to see there was a truly a distinction driven one way and not always. It, I mean, not the only thing, but, uh, you know, again, I told you, I, we could go through the Bible, we could do the passages and we could go through what it looks like. And uh, then we'll have a bunch of people that are divided because either they don't believe the Bible or they don't believe any Bible or they don't believe anything. I mean, I don't know. And so I said, well, we live in today, uh, and uh, I can now show uh, distinctions in, in the law uh, that some are legal and some are law, depending on, on how they're, what they're applied to and how they work. That I realized at the time I was setting up to do the legal thing, the legal entity side, which is a completely new, uh, whole jurisdiction on its own. It's essentially what imposes itself everywhere. I realized there was the jurisdiction of man. And you know that I don't, it may sound like, it may, that might sound stupid, it's, or maybe you may think it's naive or give it a title, but it, when I'm talking about a deep understanding about this distinction, the chasm that's in our world, the realities that of the undead versus the living and how we've been subsumed. And I chose at that time then, even though I was setting up and I had some, what I thought was to be sufficient knowledge at least to prepare the foundation of a legal existence that would I could use to shield me and bring away what I keep telling you is the imposition. You take, you take and make it. The legal tools are to make it look like you don't have anything, so that they can't take anything from you. And I thought that was, and I still think that's a viable uh, way because that's a reality. However, uh, I made a choice that I would. Uh, I noticed that there was this jurisdiction of man, not human, and it had a place, and it had dominion. And then I noticed this little thing in the Bible, for those of you that are looking, and I started to look at these, all these documents as evidences of prior wise wisdom and knowledge and history and all this other thing. It stopped being a religion. It started to be mm, another instruction book, as best as I can put it. I've told you, I don't, uh, there's a lot of things in that Bible I just don't get, don't understand. It doesn't set well with me. Um, it just doesn't make sense. But there's lots that does. And that's the part that does is what I started to listen to. And uh, there was a point that said that, uh, if you will, and if you allow me to extend to you, uh, keep it in your general terms, that God, Christ, if you will, was no, no respecter of persons. Now, at the time, that related over to exactly what, what I was doing. I was going to create a bunch of persons. And I also noted that if I go into the side where we have dominion, and most people want to want to go off, when they have an agenda, they go off about this dominion thing. It ends up being your autonomous, uh, re responsible, um, if I could say, management of your life and 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 the environment, the real environment, the natural environment, not the not the the stalking horse of environment around you. And that includes others. And this is where the we start to see the problem. We're not alone. That uh, if, I, if I'm going to be, if I can live in that spiritual side, which I was, I've seen in the natural sense for myself, I can't speak for anybody else, had some pretty interesting interactions with the nature, you know, outside of what I've ever heard a lot of people talk about. Not UBU stuff, just stuff that's interactive. To give me an insight that I said, I think I'd rather go down the path of man and not, and, and being cognizant of his fallen nature and not be that fallen nature as much as I can possibly be. But let's, let's make the choice to define ourselves not a person and not shield myself as a person, as I was finding out to do, and I think very well. Let me see if I can, if I can st walk in the world as a man, whatever that really is. And I'll tell you, it's taken many, many decades to start, to start figuring it all out. And I didn't think at the time, although we were seeing the oppression many years ago, as you heard, uh, Michael Schmidt on Ron Steffen's show, he's talked about, he's been in this fight just to try and keep raw milk in the world since 1994. If you didn't think there was an oppression on us, and you think everything's hunky-dory, go listen to that broadcast on UCY on an archive. At, the, at least at the end of the broadcast, for sure, where he was talking. If, if I understand correctly, it was, it was rock the boat. See, Ron understands you have to go do something. Rock that boat. Rock that ship of state, whatever, however you want to rationalize it. But I chose I was going to decide to try and become a man, if you will, in the face of a system of oppression called, we can identify as a system uh, that occupies us. 
And then I came on to mining law and the law of the land, literally the law of the land itself, and how we come from there. And I could start to see, if you look very carefully, only men and women can claim land or the soil, if you will. Did you understand what I just said, folks? I'm, I'm, I'm showing you, or I've had been showing you, that there's a way to track where people are, not persons. And that until you start to figure that out, you're going to be running into problems. And then when you figure out, you'll run into bigger problems. And that should have been short-lived, except for most of us are crickets. And this is what really has driven me to try and give you every week things that apparently I, I really don't know folks I I appreciate all the listeners and I appreciate what you think you're getting and what I see responding to me is just amazing well it's dismaying not amazing it's a dismay like this week dismaying disappointed I'm seeing a failure of discernment in some of what I've I've, I've heard over I've heard over the week uh, and in particular, what I talked about last week, uh, and then I'm encouraged as well. But l let me let me start let me start there, because remember I'm talking about uh, proper action. That requires that you didn't throw in the towel. That requires that you still have an interest to go do something to change it. You can't abandon this position. You can't can't have and uh, you can't make excuses about that integration. Let me go back and I would, as I was leaving the broadcast explaining the stocking horse and that this was a setup for a takedown and uh, I don't oh, maybe it didn't uh, I don't convey this very well you don't you have to understand my position is I think we the people and this came out between uh, you know in some Twitter uh, we we are readily past past some of our differences we all really recognize in our different way we live on the reservation folks we all live there Russell Means was keen to that. I call it the open-air prison. So him and I came, at least never met him, but him and I were of meeting of those minds. And you know, I've talked about this all the time. This is not different. You, this is just the thing you come on to as you start to research the, the, the prison that you've been in and they brought you to. And you, were, you have to remember, you were born into this. So be careful on how much, how much you think you can, you have to say what your opinion means before you start figuring out that battlefield, I tell you. But... So here we're breaking away uh, and breaking last week arrest issued arrest warrant issued for Amy Goodman Dakota uh, Dakota after uh, in Dakota after covering pipeline protest and a uh, comment from her was this is an unacceptable violation of freedom of the press pe freedom of the press pest is what, yeah, freedom of the pest uh, says Amy Goodman uh, in a statement I was doing my job by covering pipeline guards unleashing dogs and pepper spray on Native American protesters. Okay, fine, but you know, as I see the evidence, and, and, and listen, you have to—you just can't be talking out your out your uh, out of your own opinion. You have to go read what's been before, and I'm not saying you have to research deeply. We are in a society that believes the district court decision is the law, so let's start there. Let's start looking at what the district court found on the process that was documented fairly clearly. I think. I think there was decent job done here by the by the judge and i don't have now after seeing the treaty given we use that as a guide on where the court of competent jurisdiction is that was the court of competence jurisdiction that uh, i pointed out to you that it doesn't appear by anything that's being said that there was any reservation land that anybody was on while they were doing their protests being jumping over fences and painting a graffiti on machines and if that's the case and nobody has come back to show me otherwise and again i sit neutral to i want more facts Law, law, law of the land has shown me every new fact can actually change. Have a, it can change the the uh, the decision on how it works because we're dealing immediately with somebody's rights potentially or their interest or possessions or things like that. We're not talking about l these um, legal uh, aspirations. We're not talking about the amenities. We're not talking about our opinions or our beliefs. And this is the where I try, I've been trying to show you that that you have to break away from those opinion, those subjective things, and you have to get into the subject matter of evidence and facts. But we're not alone, so we have what I'll call you what we what is even spoken to as competing interests. But it, given that, and I haven't seen it, so as soon as I see this change in fact, I'll change my uh, my statement. Given that I can't find any public land that was open, or private land that permission was given for press so-called to be 
doing what they did where they were, that's a trespass. It doesn't surprise me that the breaking news was that Democracy Now! journalist, which is one of the media, which is part and parcel to pushing the agenda that the, the stocking horse is being used to front, to hide, to cover, uh, it, it makes news. And then said, this is a freedom of press. No, no folks, if she's trespassing, that's not a, freedom of the press is not a license to trespass. And I don't think that would be any different than if she tried to trespass the reservation when the Indians didn't want her there. No, I don't know. So, this, I'm, trying to, uh, I'm trying to figure out where is the bright lines so that we can give respect to everybody. Where they have exclusive respect, that's fine. You make sure that you assert it so we all know it. If you don't, then we got to start to look because we have all these competing interests or maybe interests that are being trespassed about people that are claiming under title that they have the right. As I look at this, if this was an official excuse and she was trespassing, under state law, that's a felony. She thinks that the press can trespass. She uses the color of authority of the First Amendment to trespass. That's a felony, folks. It's not, not just an arrest for trespass. And I think that's the respect I'm trying to bring to all of this. And again, limited to my knowledge, that I have a different take on a lot of this, and I'm attempting to work my way through on a scant uh, evidence that we're giving through all the press, but I go to a source of information, and that's that decision, the, the, uh, the opinion uh, that was written, the memorandum of laying out the facts of the process. And uh, so then I've been watching how, that, how, how things are responding and appreciate everyone's interest in it. Lots of people are tuning in uh, or, or getting the past cast. Uh, and we've had some conversation, and I, I can't uh, value that enough. What I am disappointed in, though, is the lack maybe of the discernment of what I'm actually talking about. I'm trying to bring tools to bear, trying to show that tools were not used that were available. And we have to get beyond our emotion, uh, beyond our subjective prop, uh, beliefs. So I saw a lot of this, um, I mean, just... I don't even know what to call it. I don't even have the adjectives to call this. I don't want to name it because it sounds like I'm getting judgmental. I just know it's, it's crickets, folks. I just put it that way. It's people not embracing the point and then, in a way, you know, questioning me. And I am. And then, then the discernment problem is that the, nobody, not nobody, but lots of people don't understand. I'm not attacking anybody. I will look into anything that comes in my way and I will apply how I go about resolving the problem I see. I then require certain, I can become an investigator, like I tell you, and I want certain information. Why do I want that certain information? Because in my experience and the wisdom of applying all, uh, coming through that experience, in my knowledge and research, it focuses me on certain requirements. Now, a lot of people say, oh, forget that. Well, uh, you know, again, no man's an island, no woman is an island. We live in a complex society, and I'll touch about this as I move along. And so we have to get along, and there's certain things that we have to do to do that. Certain provisions are made to do that. And so I try to bring, uh, I ask a question, I really, uh, really need an answer, otherwise I, I really, there's nothing more to say, and uh, any more that comes at me is really unsupportable. Because in my mind, if you don't satisfy the foundation of, your, of the point that's expected to be found, you don't have a point. It's pretty simple. If you work off of conjecture and can't give a proof, it, you're, it's not, I don't even have the time to waste on that. As I told you, I didn't really want to get into the DAPL issue because I, it's not my land. It's not, I saw no, no public uh, interference. I saw no, no, no private interference that was being run down, even to the, even to the decision of the, or the, uh, the complaint of the, res, uh, the, the tribes the, the, on the reservation. I saw none. And so I'm looking to find out where is it. My only uh, source would be that, that memo, actually, for objective basis. And I, like I said, go looking through it and taking the law that I know that I read. And folks, you don't, maybe don't appreciate this. It just happens to be right in the law I use all the time. So it's the mining district. 
And ironically, later we find out through another uh, piece of information that's forwarded to me, and I thank anybody for that. Uh, I see, we, we all, again, we all have the same problem with the government that's been going on now. I see the Indians had the very same problem that we have with the ONC acts and not the government not managing the land to sustainable yield. Excuse me, I just made a mistake. It's sustained yield. So you got to get rid of that sustainable stuff. And I caught myself, but I still said it. You see how easy it infiltrates the, 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 voc the vocabulary. Sustained yield wasn't being done even for the Indian trust lands that they're not being done today. It's what I deal with. So this is not really a subject matter out of, out of some of my expertise either, but the Indian lands are not my land, so I was going to say, no, I don't need to get involved, plus I got too much. And then it's become a thing, and then I realized that this was regurgitating stuff I've talked about since 2009 or before, and that, that, and that was hurting people. That was going to hurt the Indians, that was going to hurt whatever, I know they're Native American, but you know, getting the law, you got to speak to who's in the contracts. So, uh, I've just been amazed at the lack of discernment on what needs to be done and the uh, application of that in preference to people's conjecture. And my, again, my questions are kind of focused in on, I have to f start to understand it the way I understand it has to be discussed and what may be used as tools in the subject matter areas of the law that are being brought to bear. You can too, it's just a matter of reading a few things. So I was telling you, I was surprised that the uh, the uh, Indians didn't sue the, the whoever, wh whatever tribe did, it didn't bring the NEPA first, instead they brought some useless law and, and, and they didn't bring it. The attorneys that I tell you is the harm, the agent of harm and destruction pushing an agenda that they utilized in the indigenous people to destroy them too over time was why they didn't do the proper proper uh, law to bring their power if they have some which was really just a witness of impacts and then even underneath the law the evidence that was cited as the, the judge as a clerk redocumenting through all the evidence that was before him in the in the decision everything that was before him to look at to apply the law or the standard is really what they were looking at there in NEPA, the, the tribes didn't bring what they needed to bring. Now, if there is evidence of that, that they didn't bring, that's really their fault. I think that's the plan of the attorneys. But that's not the problem of the government to assert the rights. Remember, I've told you over and over, you, don't ha you only have the rights you assert. Now, there's another relation, uh, a duty somewhere, but I, we, we're so far from that, we aren't seeing that where the judge is actually supposed to look at, and I can't say he didn't do it here or she at any time, uh, that they look ahead to see if there's anything that wasn't stated that was the trust duty of the government to, to, set, to um, interject where the attorney's representation didn't. That's again the law being brought. So you're in the treaties, you're in the law, not legal. Whatever the process is, it's not legal. And this has been one of the things that's been uh, really blows me away uh, in, in something that came out. But let me let me get on. So, so I appreciate where I saw that you know I'm kind of dismayed and disappointed in some things. And I know we're in the internet. It's a it's a distant thing. We're really not in a in a room talking with each other. And we might be able to work this all this stuff out earlier uh, faster. But on the other hand, and uh, Vince, and I appreciate Vince's work really working hard to figure out, like, he's doing this, this, the work climbing the hill to figure it out, trying to figure it out, taking however, I, I, whatever, however I'm doing it, he's trying to take what I'm saying, and I, I'm, I appreciate that, and I don't, and I think it's, it will be advantageous that anybody, as I say, take the lead, uh, let me put you on the trail, and you run down and qualify what I'm saying, find what you're going to find, because that's new to you, that's new to me if I haven't seen it, uh, and then you apply what I'm saying, we'll get there quicker, because this is a long time, I, I cannot expect people to take three decades to do what I now believe I really clearly know, clearly see in the subject matter areas that I, will, that I believe is um, no, no, uh, no wool over my eyes. The events provided not a conundrum, really, but his, his findings, and that's fine, whether I agree or not is not the point, is that Vince took the, 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 the initiative and provided additional contributions to this DPA, DAPL matter on his feedback broadcast, I think it was yesterday, which you, you need to listen to, and thank, thank you for your support. 
uh, Vince. Um, but I, let's make sure we don't blind. I, I really want that test from everybody. And I know you're working hard to pull that up too. So, so he's brought some contributions uh, from which I can explain more easily. Yes, I said it easily. What is not being apprehended in what I see in response. Uh, or, or apparently so. So my intention has always been to try and get people to respond the way they need to. It's not my decision to deny anybody a thing that they have. I mean, it's, but I also have to be careful to not being um, uh, overwhelmed uh, by conjecture. That's a killer here. Very killer. So Vince proposed on his broadcast called Feedback, the synthesized matter, as we were going through discussions this week, uh, uh, one where I, the synthesized matter, but in some contention that's going on, and maybe not so much after listening to it, but again, I'm just strictly looking at process to afford people the power that they have to make sure that they get their point presented. But it's not it's not in isolation, and that's, our, that's the thing I think people are not getting. Uh, that uh, where I speak of what is the legal thing to do, uh, I speak in opposition to those that want to know what uh, to do, what you know, do what is the right thing to do. And so I found that uh, uh, helpful. It reduces the focus on the on at least the, the question or the distinction. But to all that believe this. This distinction between I speak to the legal thing and everyone else that kind of uh, denounces maybe or denies or just ignores what I'm saying, that they think it, they're, they want to take the road that says they want to do the right thing, um, I completely disagree. Completely. So what is, why? I mean, what do we, remember I said we're no man is an island, no woman is an island, all that stuff. We don't live by ourselves. So what is the right thing to do is a subjective opinion. But the right thing to do is a subjective opinion. And in this, in this condition where we live together, it must stand the test in the reality of competing interests. Secondly, to denounce the process, which, is, which provides the forum for such a contest, is to forego the opportunity to present what would be right. Be careful when you deny the process because then you hand the power to whoever has the power, the real power. So saying F the legal system, as I heard, is misguided and ill-informed. Ill -informed. It, it, there's just no, I don't even know where to start with that one. I know we, talk, we make the distinction between what's legal and what's law, and we want to maintain a law and we want to do that, but there is, you have to look very carefully before you start denouncing things that just because it's uh, the courts and uh, that we know, I can, again, I'm talking past my knowledge of the corruption and who is a corruption. Despite the seats of decision and the system becoming corrupted, we can still look through and see whether or not that seat of decision is done the mostly right. So I said in our, broad, in, in our lawsuit, we didn't sue the attorneys or even the bar association where they do right. We sued where they're doing wrong and hurting people. In other words, if you just heard what I just said, doing wrong without hurting people isn't really wrong enough in that legal system, and who's there to complain anyway? And though that sounds bad in my mind, why would you do any wrong? The point is it didn't hurt anybody, so no harm, no foul, right? So there's some underlying interesting little things we can recognize when we go through this. And what I'm saying is that this, this process is allows the Anyone that has, has a right to bring up, bring into the table, we call the table, put on the table their cards, of, their proof that what is right, what they think is right. But it's in an environment of competing interests. So throwing that process out by just kind of dismissing it as the F the legal system is, was really, I mean, I had to take, a, I really had to sit back a bit. Uh, I'm really wondering, now, what, what are people listening when I say stuff? What, what are they reading out there? So the point, again, on this, and maybe a little bit of an, uh, an idea, is we've got to stop throwing the baby out with the river water, as it were, here in this project. But we, we have to really start discerning better what we have available to us. To believe what you think is right is superior to anyone else's opinion of what is right 
it's simply, I mean, a thug's mentality. I just, can't, I don't know what else to say about it. Just you're going to say just because you have an opinion that that's what is right. Before we get to what is right, however, we, you have to have a meaningful opportunity to peacefully assert that. And we say peacefully because there's a lot of ways to go unpeaceful, and that's not really what law is about. When you get to the peaceful part, you're in law. It's to maintain peace and settlement and, and ability to work together, despite our differences. For instance, where I saw a comment last weekend that someone didn't think the pipeline is either a utility or a necessity when we were talking about the treaty, which is on its face, as the utility easement is, is identified, is clearly erroneous. But even if I agreed with that, that it was a utility or necessity, because neither of us is a party to the treaty, our opinion about that is all irrelevant. In a way, I can use that to take one more step back and say, okay, I can look in on this and see, just watch it. I can, I can watch the measure in the black and white of the treaty and see what, what's been agreed to by the parties. So in, in particular, if you, those of you that read the treaty, it clearly shows the parties agreeing to decisions from what constitutes a utility or a necessity construction, quote, look right out of the black and white, may be ordered or permitted by the laws of the United States. Close quote. By the terms of the treaty, neither we nor the Indians make the determination, do we? By the terms of the treaty, we have to be party as well. By the terms of the, the terms of the treaty is what constitutes the utility and necessity. Therefore, our opinion of the matter means nothing. A similar is our opinion of what we think is right. Now, I've heard people go off on well, what, about what, clarity, uh, cleanliness. You know, what's wrong about cleaning the water and the pr priority? Well, uh, that's uh, that's the false question to respond to in the fact of the reality. And this is where the process becomes important. So regarding the processes afforded to the parties of the project, and looking at it through the treaty side, under the laws of the United States, those with the showing of a need of what is right for them are the only parties having standing to say. So all of us outside uh, in the peanut gallery really have nothing to, to really say. We just observe. So I'm talking about the process here. I'm not talking about opinions. I'm not arguing any points. I'm not trying to get into any of that. I'm trying to show if you don't start to understand any of you that are really interested in what the, was going on and want to see the better answer, the better, the better result, you have to understand this process. See, given, given that this is, so, this is so called legal process, again, this word became a hang-up, uh, again, we have to really look carefully at this. The so-called legal process agreed to by the parties to say F the legal uh, would be a breach of that treaty, wouldn't it? Because they have agreed on what that process is. It is. Not being a non-party, that suggestion is at least ignorant, unwise, and detrimental, isn't it? Ignorant, unwise, and detrimental came to mind. And really, it's a trespass to have an opinion over somebody else. But the process that they've figured out for themselves is what they did. With the underlying understanding and caveat that there is a lot about these treaties that wasn't so cool either. But see, when you start to go research, you start to realize there are tools for that as well, which I won't touch. At this point, I'm still trying to get through the people to see, understand you better embrace a process that's offered or you have nothing or to say and dismiss everything on conjecture is going to give you nothing but trouble. When you could have taken all your energy and you put focus in the right thing, right way, and you, get, you can get out what you need. What was there? And then somebody do sing a song about that? You may not get what you want, but you get what you need. See, you, you can't F legal in this regard and, and kill the process that, regard, uh, that allows you the resolution. And to his credit, Vince did not fall into the F and legal trap. See, this is what I'm listening for 
we're looking at engaging a problem to resolve it. And in his feedback, he went through an analysis on his point, the way he understands it, how he did it, uh, referencing my, my work, which is okay, great. And I, I listened as well uh, when I had, I'd had a bit of time to listen, making sure it's integrated it's mostly all okay so that we can at least keep going on down the path to, to resolve a real serious problem that's going to go out of hand if we're not careful. Well, you started to see it happen. They, brought, they called in the National Guard and some people got arrested, and that should have told you something as well. No, it got spun up as being a wrong. Oh, the big bad government, the big bad corporate, you know, pipeline layers. But in reality, on the ground, law of the land, I'm not so sure that much went wrong there. And part of it's because you didn't, you, you those of you that are understand, are in this and interested, you didn't insist that the people that are on the front lines I don't mean the protest. I'm talking about the people in, in the administrative side of the tribal, uh, the tribal diplomats, if you will, didn't do it better, uh, which is clearly found that they didn't really, they didn't really do so well in the in the listing. And if that's wrong, that's dictated wrong by the judge in the decision. That's a point for review. So Vince didn't fall in the F trap. He brought up some more contribution, I should say. You know, I'll just put it that way. But with all, without, with all due regard to Vince's attempt to provide focus upon the matter, this is not a matter of what is legal versus what is right. Now, I appreciate the focus, but this is not actually a matter of, of what is legal versus what is right. What is right, so called, in a complex society, does not exist in a vacuum. Now, the surface, well, isn't water right? Is, isn't clean water important? Uh, yeah, but that belies the problem of the complexity that you're dealing with because you're presuming something onto water that where it is in reality isn't what you're talking about. And so going back to a process which works this out, condemning that process to provide a forum will eliminate that opportunity for asserting what is right. But it's not in a vacuum, so it's against competing interests. And this is where I keep telling you about you really got to get organized in your mind about how this works in order to make your records and do them properly. So I've heard, you know, this thing, statism and the system and F legal and all this other stuff. But I'm trying to say that there's, when, you're, when you realize you're in a reservation, you're in a prison, there's a certain process of communication. That's all that's left to you. You better adopt at least that much. And do that with all your worth, and I suspect, as we have been finding, that, that, that even so, it seems to work well. Which I'm actually disappointed to not see it happen, because I think, the, uh, given that there was a tribal power, a tribal need and value, if I can say it that way, need and right, they would have been much more positioned to put it. But the, but the, the, the court memo, that ever, you have to read that court memo, pro provides nothing in substance that was inter interfering with, with the Indians' Uh, even to the extent of the water they now claim that they're trying to protect. Because they had the opportunity then uh, to identify how uh, wasn't sufficient what was in there. We'll get a little bit to that. I want to, because Vince offers some interesting insight, well, things I didn't know that could have been used. And I'm still wondering why it wasn't. Like, so we, we, we say condemn the process, condemn this thing. It's just, we all want to see us the protesting get out there and, and beating on each other. That, that, folks, that's not even under the treaty. It's not correct under the treaty. I mean, even under the ill-conceived New Age anarchism that I, I'm hearing about, even as, a, as, as guided by the principle of the right to choose a private arbiter, which I'll tell you has failed, actually, but no one wants to listen to the truth of this. I was particularly involved in a case that went to appeal uh, for a friend of mine, and we won the point, and they showed that arbitration and private arbitration is not judicial and not justice. Yeah, but anyway, that's aside. See, I have a whole other thing I look at. I guess, again, because of my experience of where I've been. That's okay. But, but so, so the, the, the current anarchists will say, oh, well, we have the right to go private arbiter. Fine. Even using that as a guidance, the parties of the treaty determined their arbitration forum. It's written right there for anybody who wants to read the treaty. I'm talking about the 1868 now. 
And before we go off, but there was an 1851, as I'll get to here, I'm trying to get my mind through this, there was no treaty relevant in the decision. And the Indians didn't bring that up, so, and because of their national heritage, or maybe despite it, they, they, the attorneys didn't make a claim. So let's not get too involved with these treaties, more than to use them as a guideline to say there was prior authority of agreements between the parties that have not denounced that mechanism of process. Now, we don't have a right to interfere, even so. But whatever our, even if, whatever we, we, we can suggest to them things, but we, we have no right to have form an opinion that we then promote to others as, as the thing to promote. In particular, when I look out and I see that's harming those people. How extended as it might seem, our words travel far. So even underneath an arbit the, the agreement with a new, new Age anarchism that says, oh, we have the right to go to private arbiter, uh, an arb private forum, the treaty had that built into it, saying, F, the legal system, has no place then. To dismiss this process as legal as you might want to identify it, it is, has no place. I don't know. It just has no place. It's just, and it's destructive. I can just tell you that. So, so let, me, let me move on beyond those who might say F the legal system on this process and try to get through to people that haven't given up and want to uh, engage what we have available to us. And explain again what everyone, I say everyone, those that are interested, it, it seems to be apparently missing by our interactive communication this week and then comments I've been hearing and, and questions being asked and all that stuff. And I'm not, again, I'm not making a judgment. I just want us to do better. Really, that's really it for us. For me, I don't have another thought. Just We do better when we learn better. And I'm hoping to try and communicate this stuff uh, better, I guess. I guess I'm feeling a bit of a failure on my own. I'm just not, yes, telling you what it is. Uh, or again, I, I can't speak to those that have given up. That's for sure. That, that's, for, that's for sure. So maybe that's part of it. And I've heard that said a couple times this week, which I was interested, because then why do you continue? I, I'm not talking to people that have just kind of thrown their hands up or just make excuses. I see a way back through what we have been uh, occupied by, whether we're on a reservation, we think that the reservation are for the other people, or we live, we think we're in freedom within the United States borders. So what we see is the legal in this process is actually, you know, this term legal to vilify it, to give us an excuse not to engage it, because legal's not law. Well, legal is law in this case. What I say is this, this legal is the law. You're talking about the land. You're talking about the relative rights of parties. And in this case, it's not even treaty rights we're talking about. We're talking about a government that extended opportunity for people to make a say about how they're impacted by a federal imposition. How many times did the federal government ask you anything? But you should just think about that and realize how big it is that they've given the opportunity. Whether or not the government agencies will do that is another point, another contention. However, it's there. And they certainly did this thing called consultation with the Indians, despite, despite the objection that it didn't happen. So this is not just mere legal. Yeah, it comes through legal consequences and things. But what we're dealing with is really the law. It's the agreement between parties. to uh, It's the contract between parties. And it's made to benefit anyone that can show an action by the government may create an adverse impact, which must be mitigated practicably. Now, I just All I'm doing is I'm stating the law that any PA as to what your rights are, not in treaty, but an obligation of Congress for you all. Now you turn your nose up to it or think, think you're more, more authoritative than that offer, uh, good luck, that's all I can say. And that's why I don't have much sympathy at this point with the, one of the tribes that's made the lawsuit and then lost on the injunction. And I actually see clearly what that was. But I had to go read the document, uh, at least the treaty, which wasn't relevant, but it gave me a perspective. It gave me the place that we're doing this and it gave me, then, the, then reading the decision, gave me a, an orientation of the interaction between the parties as they had previously agreed and not complained was not sufficient. They just complained things weren't happening when in fact uh, that, that was happening right in front of their eyes and it was transparent to them. That's not going to get you anywhere. And I think there's a reason for that. It was willful blindness. A anyway, anyway, anyone reading the applicable laws of the United States cannot form a basis for an opinion. 
If you're not reading these laws of the United States that drive this opportunity, you really don't, you can't understand what you're talking about. You just can't, I just don't see it. I've been doing this for 10 years. There's no way. I got people that are reading it that, can't, that don't quite get it. We've worked that out. But to be outside of this knowledge and understand what was at, where it's actually available, the tool that's available to us, and then to say that what's going on, to have an opinion beyond that, whether you find out you haven't read this stuff, I can't have, there's no credibility I can extend to you. Despite my yearning to extend that to everybody. I want everybody knowing this stuff. But it takes a will to want to continue and not, not to give up and to not make excuses. And I'm not saying that you grab the world by the throat. Uh, I'm saying you pick, as I say, you, make, you find that wrong you make right and go within the subject matter of your wrong that you want to make right and find out the tools that are there. They're there. It's just what astonishes me. And the failure of the discernment to see that is what disappoints me. And what hurt, I guess I not say hurt, what I just wonder about me not being able to communicate that, that I've been talking so many years on this. Anyone speaking upon the matter whom has not read the decision of the court denying the Standing Rock Sioux injunction cannot have a sufficient basis to form an opinion. I say that because without knowing the process and what happened and, manage, and, 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 and uh, comparing what was supposed to happen in the process to what did happen and whether or not there was discrepancies, you can't possibly have a conversation about this and their rights. Anyone who ha has read these, uh, these two documents will know the process requires overcoming the burden of production to show an impact is occurring. Why? Because you're not so sovereign that you're independent in the world and can you force everybody to your will. There's competing interests. And this process, and this is the, the burden of a prosecution, is, uh, the burden is always on the prosecutor of the right they claim to prove it. In other words, I go in as a minor and I say, I've got a property and I've got the title. I don't walk in and just make the claim. I've got to produce the, no, the, the evidence of my title. And then I have to establish that it's done correctly. And then I have to establish the evidence of the, the point. And then I have to establish the evidence that it's been trespassed. That's a burden on me. This is an unknown. If we didn't have that legal so-called process, well, you can have anybody say anything. And this is how the UN does it. They say anything and not supported by any law and you believe it and they win. And this is the thing I'm fighting. Make sure that people are bringing not their conjecture and their, and their other nonsense, whatever, uh, un unsupportable things. M force someone to bring the proof of their claim. So the, so the burden is upon the one asserting because this weeds out the spacious and frivolous, arbitrary and capricious, hypothetical, hyperbola, etc. claims that are made. There's a reason behind this. It's not just legal. It's how we figured out the better way that we work out our differences. And if you throw this down, you're, you're throwing away a very valuable tool and you're requiring that you move on to things that you try to then uh, excuse as uh, doing the what is right. And in fact, the facts don't prove that out. That's just fairy tales and puffs of smoke and whatever to get someone else to believe that you, you're you not committing a crime. Uh, and, the, and the treaty is pretty powerful in that regard as well. So contrary to all opinions I've read, the standing rock about, the, you know, I just don't know. The opinions I've read about the standing rock were given, the oper were not, uh, were given, uh, People saying that they weren't given, that Standing Rock were not given the opportunity to contribute their findings. I don't believe that. If you look at the record, you, I don't know of anybody, you have to point it out, how they were not given an opportunity. And this is where I started seeing the gameplay, and this is where I started to point out there was something going on and people were being played. 
And this is a frustration I have because what was extended to the tribes, man, uh, blew me away as compared to how they treat Jefferson Mining District. So instead of contributing, you find in the record, the record of the case written down, that the tribe made demands which were not relevant to the process. It appears from the court statement of facts the tribe seemed to be playing games with its opportunity, which they delayed for quite some time. And I'm making these statements. You're free to go read it, and you're free to come to your own conclusions and, and send me an email, markonthebeachyahoo.com, where I'm missing this point as compared to the what's required underneath law and the opportunity to do such things. And you have, I did some... Inf I inf in looking inside the case, I'm inferring some things from the discussion of the uh, court deci decision. The tribe was asserti assor uh, asserting what it thinks is a sovereignty. The, 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 it's like the, because we were sovereign, we're a sovereign nation, you'll, you'll bow to our will. But this is a misinterpretation of that status, folks. I mean, you just don't know what to say. So that with sovereignty comes a very high obligation and duty to do really what's right. Do what's right, not just talk about it, not make demands. The status imposes a duty of diplomacy, not, irreverent, not an irreverent disregard. And the process of provided gives an opportunity to take the power that people have uh, in its fullness and, hand, uh, uh, and, and to participate on the table of the discussion and to bring what you need is right, what you feel is right, and work out how that is going to happen. Not that it's not going to happen. You're not given the opportunity that it can happen. So when I come to see a process as much as was given and we see the protests afterwards, I'm shaking my head in, dis, in dis, dis, dismay. And then to see people pointing fingers on who, who to blame. Remember, I told you, three fingers are pointing back. And if, I, if anything I'm saying is wrong or it's not, like they, it wasn't written in the, in the decision and it was presented in these hearings that were given the process, any errors of fact in the injunction decision all can be reviewed. And this is another rule, though. If it only, only what was presented can be reviewed. So this is not an open door to bring more in. You're supposed to do it in the process. You're not supposed to drag your feet, play games with all you, the authority you think you have, when you have the diplomatic mission to work with another entity, and we say a nation. I was, I've read, read many different uh, submissions by people throughout different things that Someone exhorting that no consultation was provided after January. I found that date very interesting with respect to what goes on in the process in those dates. In one regard, consultation had already been accomplished. They now moved on to a new phase. So you wouldn't necessarily call the meetings they had after the, when the EA got started, the environmental assessment, as a, as a consultation. Yet they were meeting, if you go read the court's decision. The court's memorandum shows, in fact, the process was the environmental assessment, the EA, what they call the EA. It's one of the stages, the NEPA. It's the early stage. They got another one after that. And when we get to that date and you keep reading, you find out all of a sudden the, the Indians are deciding that they'll start contributing to the process. Apparently, that triggered that notice triggered some kind of thought that we're really doing it for in earnest, when in fact, the consultation process was in earnest the entire time for over a year and a half before, I think it was. And uh, various people worked well. Some decided to cross their shoulders, uh, put their arms across their, their chest and, 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 and stand in, in disregard. Uh, I'm sovereign or whatever. I don't know what the reason was. And so after the process of the EA, you're not really in the process of consultation that way. You're now bringing together all the information for the, to make the assessment. That's when now the Indians start contributing. Finally, Standing Rock uh, stands up and uh, they did provide some evidence that the tribe felt would be impacted, how the tribe would be impacted by the pipeline. That's the process. Bring it forward, guys. Put it there. But what they brought 
that they thought were going to be part of the project area to impact them were not actually in that area. And therefore, beyond, based on the assessment of all that was brought before the agency, the Corps concluded its assessment and renders its decision in July of 2000, this year, 2016. Then, this, then the Standing Rock sue under the injunction and the court responds and concurs that the process of looking at the impacts of everyone that may have a say in that was uh, properly done. That said, anybody who has a contrary view, when you look, not to me, but if you look in the record and you find that the, something was submitted and not taken care of by the court that impacts you, not a meaningless thing, a meaningless error, a meaningful error, you can sue to enjoin that part if it's relative, relevant. So there's, I'm not saying anything that stops anybody. I'm saying you better all understand that it's a process. You can call it legal and dismiss it, but it is the tool you're given. And I'm suggesting over the 10 years of doing this stuff, uh, it's a very powerful tool. So we look again, because I was a little bit interested in this, with a lot of discussion on the treaty stuff. And like I said last week, there was information uh, in the broadcaster. I said it's, it's um, certainly um, informa uh, informative, but it wasn't relevant. That it was kind of a surprise to look at the court does not document any treaty rights asserted by the tribes. And this, is confir this confirms pretty much um, what I guess someone thought, of, uh, thought I was making an issue over the fact that it wasn't tribal land. That was not supposedly back to me was, well, that wasn't a secret. My view is that wasn't a disclosure. It wasn't about being a secret. It wasn't a disclosure in the media or into everyone that says you're dealing with lands that are not on the reservation because the implication by all the writings was that it was. I certainly got that implication. I was surprised when I read the decision by the court. This was not land on the reservation. So now we have a different standard. That one fact changed just about everything. And it, but I told you last week, I went through the analysis, why it changed, what it changed, and how I just keep moving on with the new fact. We just start applying the new, new result. And it proved then out that NEPA would be the applicable thing, not the treaty. So the, the treaty was never, never asserted. The facts prove out why. It had no relevance. So give, given there's no treaty interests relevant, someone saying the 1855, excuse me, 1851 treaty, I think that was the date, uh, ha has some effect, it's, it's of no additional aid. Nothing of those the kind was asserted. And so those are, these are things that are thrown up, uh, regurgitated, I would suppose, not relevant that we all take in and we think it's important, and it's actually not when in reality. In the case brought by the parties, in the evidence brought. Now, if the treaty, if that's incorrect that it was not, then to me, looking at this, See, I really am trying to take a neutral place. I'm wondering, see, I'm looking for the players. I'm looking for how people are inside us get, hurting us. Now, I, I feel we really all are equally being hurted in our different ways. And we all were walking wounded about this. And we've, uh, we've kind of given up to that point, And we just kind of just only, we end up lashing it out. But if, if it's incorrect that there was treaty level stuff that was needed to be in this process, and the attorneys that were pushing the agenda didn't put it in, it only further proves the attorneys are not working with the, for the Indians' interests. But as I proved to you last week, promoting their destruction, the Indians' destruction. It, so take that as, as you might. I'm saying there's a, there's a caution you better, a cautionary look you better re-look re at. W within the process, we might be exposing, uh, exposing the, the harmful agent. if the treaty was supposed to be put in and it wasn't. Why wasn't it if it's so important? But if it's not, why are people saying it's important? So what do I get to do behind the woodshed? I have to look at what the court found. And if, that was the, if the, what the court found is a problem, then the people that are the parties that were subject to that decision, they have to find that out themselves. And we, we should be seeing the appeal for those exact points pretty soon, if not immediately. So this is the process. We can call it the legal process. This is the process in law that's been provided that we continue to work this out amongst ourselves and this thing that we're, uh, we're, we do have competing interests over.
So again, I'm, I'm really kind of focusing on this this attitude that uh, just f legal. I really that bothered me a lot. I mean, we can use the word legal, and because we know, as you hear me say all the time, legal is not that good. But that's not the case here. That's a mischaracterization of the process to excuse away that there might be some things here that I see are very powerful tools, a weapons, if you will, being laid down, and then you walk the fodder into the meat grinder. I say that I want to. I just want to. I don't know if I want to say it. Cause, oh, listen, oh, so he hurts so bad. I feel a lot more hurting on that point for the Indian people uh, than I think people may, than I try to, I try to not make this emotional type thing. It's, um, I hear people getting hurt. It, 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 it really bothers me. Um, and I have to kind of step back and say, okay, well, there's, I'm bothered, but we have to work through how to resolve that harm. Saying F, F the legal system about this is not going to do that. I just tell you. It's uncalled for. It's short-sighted, uh, and that's to say the least. And then remember the peanut gallery problem. We got no say over that. Give, given the process provided allows uh, com for competing interests to come to a forum to assert those impacts or needs, if there is an assertion for what is right, it needed to be presented when the tribes enjoyed the opportunity. It needed to be presented then. Now, because you presented what you thought was right doesn't mean you win. That's the other part. It's certainly not something that you then say because you didn't win, because they didn't agree with what you thought was right, that you get to go do other things that are not really so cool. And in this regard, you're getting close to that. We all oh, going to protect the water. Yeah, it's no, not high and noble. I agree with that. We don't want to have polluted water. Don't think that what I'm saying here is judging that we should have polluted water. I'm actually trying to argue against it, but no one wants to understand what I'm actually getting at here. To merely say what is right is to protect water after the fact, where there's no evidence of any actual peril, is certainly misguided, if not irresponsible, especially where it goes to the point of causing people to be arrested. So, moving into who contributes. Don't just throw their hands up or just take say conjecture. And listening to Vince, he offered some evidence. And if that evidence had been... Where, where what I see, I see a lot of these, these things that you started to see dead people. You start seeing stocking horses everywhere. If, if, if protecting water had, is not a, a stocking horse afterthought that it seems to me to be, this that what Vince brought as his, his observations could be evidence which might provide a test as to the sufficiency of the standards used in certifying the pipe transport system. Utility. He brought evidence that if I'd have heard it before, see, I don't know everything, I just he's got these, some experience he pulled through out there. That when we're sitting at the table, you bring what he said, if you, if you knew this stuff, and I'm sure somebody knew it, you would place that problem on the table as a as a as a, a potential harm to offset the promotion of the safe of the, of the certification of the pipe safety this is this is what i'm explaining to you always about making your all important record it's not your conjecture it's not our opinion from the peanut gallery it's standing in the place, going and doing the thing that needs to be done properly. Given that not, no, no, nothing of the sort regarding the record was provided, the court can only decide upon the facts in evidence. And I don't, to expect other, otherwise is unrealistic. Uh, as well, I mean, I, I just said... Uh, Reality, folks. Reality. We, we, we have this just a lot of responses uh, to this matter are not based in any reality. Not, not addressing the process in the proper way. To complain now where, where no one met the burden for what they felt was right is really a self, the self-inflicted wound I keep telling you all about. What is right objectively? Objectively. Beyond subjective belief, or mere, uh, the mere amenities I really hear going on. 
objectively presented was not proven by evidence. If I say that and you get offended, I don't know what more to say. You either learn that you have to engage the process with factual evidence beyond hyperbola, beyond conjecture, beyond hypotheticals. Well, I can just predict you're on a revol you're 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 fighting a revolution, all right. You're going to go round and round on that damn wheel until they they just exterminate all of y'all. Whoever that, it don't have to be just the Indians. They're exterminating all of us, folks. See, you don't. Everybody's so trigger happy anymore, right? Oh, I got to have my safe space. I really, I'm self censorship. Uh, you know, I try not to too much, but there's a sensibility I also try to speak to. But sometimes it gets very difficult. Everybody wants to be all wounded. They're all wounded, so any any kind of abrasion is really a a certain thing. I'm trying to say, let's get beyond that, and despite our wounds, let's move. Let's do the right thing, the righter thing. You want to do what is right, you got to do. You know, there's this declare. Where was the evidence? Nothing in the court record that I can see. To trespass here after you don't do that, after the fact, when you don't do what was provided, that certainly has to be a breach of the peace, and I think that was found when they started arresting people, even though media and alternative media called it a government, you know, uh, oppression corporation control it was to me it's nothing of the sort based on the record if you have a contrary view and you have something relevant pertinent and material to support that the contrary view you don't argue with me go to where you need to put it in and put it in I'm pausing again. I want people to think about what I'm saying. You know, it's real easy to complain. It's a lot harder to get things done correctly. I, I, I mean, I'm a, I know that. But I'm just, I, I just, I guess I'm really. I don't know where the source is. I'm uh, just disappointed to hear what I've been hearing over this matter and watch people going to be destroyed. The things are destroyed, and it doesn't stop at the Indians. It's going to go move on. I told you that last week. And I told you at the beginning of the broadcast, there's evidence brought before me that shows that we're suffering the same, the, the, the things the Indians suffered back in, in, in uh, 33 or so, the New Deal. Oh, that's right, it was called the Indians' New Deal. We all suffer, even to today. No timber harvest at, at sus sustained yield levels. And then our forests burn. And be just because people would rather fight with me or give me their opinion than to just do the facts and show the law and go after these people the way I think that it looks like it works. And once we do that and we find I'm wrong, well, I guess we tried our best at that point, but no one's saying I'm wrong yet. And in our, my experience and then the wisdom gained through the experience that we do shows that we're absolutely on target with this thing. There just isn't enough of us. So arrests have been made. Uh, on on this 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 point uh, through the you know the, the media distorts the whole thing. Alternative media included distorted it. I pointed that out. Real disappointed in that as well. Then you look given the factual record of the decision. If you find the fault in one, it gives the party the right to review. What's wrong with that? Why aren't they doing that instead of uh, getting themselves, you know, being attacked and bitten by dogs and putting themselves on the wrong side of the law, I would say at this point, over conjectural concerns that they that never have been proven in court at all or even offered correctly, which I can show you. I don't know if you listened to really, I told you that this water without borders is a UN-driven thing to destroy us. If you don't think Flint, Michigan comes right back up in this through this, I don't see why you haven't seen that. This is how they're doing it to all of us. So whatever I'm saying that you don't like, go look at the record. If I'm wrong, show me where I'm wrong. But if I'm wrong, that means there was evidence otherwise. If that was wrong, then you have to go to review. Don't argue with me. Maybe tell me so I have a better understanding. But don't, don't just assume I'm under assumptions. I'm under my research based in my, my experience based on law and the application that I see as we go through and do it to try and make things better for us and hopefully everyone. Again, I deal in production, so it's water is important and all of that. It provides societal needs, those competing complex needs. Everyone's got a demand somewhere, don't they? 
So it, this, this thing, even in the treaty, it, it provides a, a right of review and a process. What it does not provide is to take your frustration out of private property or claim harms that aren't proven. So in this regard, I'm back to Vince again, and try to get there three times, uh, to hit, have him explain this pipeline contracts thing. That was fascinating to me. From an insurance industry document, if I remember him saying right, that normally do not, these pipeline contracts that goes over land, does not include maintenance and repair clauses. That was fascinating. And this is reminding me about the oil industry. It's so complex at some level. Everybody has their contract and their agreement. And if you don't understand all this, you're going to get, you get a, you're, well, you're walking into the shark area, the shark tank. So regarding that point alone that Vince was saying, do you think it might be something which, uh, might be a mitigating factor to improve the fidelity to the pipeline that the tribe should have asked for. Right? That we let's do this, let's make sure we know who's doing the maintenance and the repair and maybe filing the bonds that do the protection. Now money doesn't make clean water, but at least we have a way to fix it up, don't we? Give us some measure of buffer. What, what about where Vince was saying that, and I've known this, and he, he he confirmed it, sometimes when you backfill your pipes, you don't necessarily get the right sand. You might throw some boulders in there and fix it. It's quicker and, fi and, and faster, and you get it done, don't you? But you don't lay the bed correct for the pipe. And those little sharp rocks have a tendency to work their way in, don't they? What about, where was, when they found out that the pipe was not even going over the reservation, but the Indians had an input, even if the property owners didn't for themselves, the Indians uh, had the right to uh, the ability to say, "Why don't you make? Uh, why? Do, where are your where are your maintenance contracts and your repair contracts built? Uh, your your right? You know, the, the, where is that settled in the in the pipeline company? Uh, and then then ex educate the property owners that allowed that. Maybe an error now that they see the problem. That you also then insist that have an on site. Tr the on-project site tribal inspector to ensure the proper installation of the pipeline, where they make sure they bed it in sand, make sure that it's at the standard that would inc increase the likelihood of uh, fidelity in the pipeline and service. Vince said it's not necessarily uh, done. I'm sure it's, if evidence could have been produced to prove it. Why not just ask for it? Why don't I hear these things? See, if you insert these and they're not recognized, that, that would, my mind would have been a much better appeal than just saying, oh, I'm a water protector. So there just things, after Vince was talking, things came to my mind. Uh, whether or not they're fully relevant or not and would have power to do whatever, I don't know, but they, sir, to me, would have been asserting someone's, someone's authority to do so and get a force of response uh, to balance the need, which may shove the uh, dependability situation up to where it's a lot more comfortable than just having someone tear through, which they didn't do actually in this case, and just put a pipe in the ground, you don't know how it's going in, they, they certify standards, you know those inspections are no good, make an independent surveyor. It wouldn't take much to see whether or not sand or rock was thrown in against that pipe, would it? Was that even asked for? Was that even done? And if it was, and they're going to do it to standard, and you didn't, you didn't argue that standard was not sufficient, right? Well, what are you going to complain more about? In this process, did the tribe assert, I see no evidence, I'm asking, you can tell me, I'm offering it as a suggestion of what could, be, could have been done. Did the tribe assert the process, in, the, in this process that they were offered, an alternative transmission designed to mitigate the problems associated with a water crossing to counter the company's suggestion that it met sufficient criteria. That takes a whole lot more work. You'd probably have to have some engineers, but there it was. Did you do it? And if you didn't, why not if that was important? Did the tribe assert mitigation measures along its river border in case of a pipe malfunction? I don't know. It's not in the record. Why not? Did the competing interest get tested in the forum of choice by that? Absolutely not, if it's not recorded, right? So why are we going to blame the company? You don't get what you don't assert. Now, those things I'm telling you, I, I think they're material, they're substantive, they're relevant, they're pertinent, they're all the things that the rule of law, uh, the rule of the rules of law, require that they be. They're not frivolous, they're not spacious, they're not arbitrary and capricious. 
and they are and they had they could have been asserted in the process that could not be denied this is where i work you identify what you need to do and you start and you make a record of it and that tests that puts it in that forum for test and the competing interest which i've told you before which made it be slipping by people when you do that the burden falls on the government to prove that it has done those things or couldn't do and had to come up with almost. See, these things that I'm telling you could be done. The process provided allows that. So saying, F the legal this or that, whatever this thing you think you see, would be to destroy that opportunity. Uh, that's not too smart. In, in particular right now with this environmental or societal competing interest where the environment is this foreign agenda to destroy us all. I mean, any, any weapon in a fight, you know, down to your fingernails if you have to, but we're not supposed to be getting to that far. And so that, that's when we start to go there, when there was other tools, I start to wonder about us. But, I mean, I, I, I can tell you, I mean, I, can't, I can tell you something, folks, about doing this. We would relish even one meeting provided to the tribes that's denied to the Jefferson Mining District, despite the law that would re requires otherwise. One meeting, folks. Uh, to say consultation in this case was not provided to the Indians is, a, is an insult to my intelligence, as after I read the court record. Uh, and at least, if not an insult to the integrity of the tribes themselves. Which ultimately, in the record, we can't find any actual impacts that weren't treat, uh, adjusted, uh, worked around. They worked they, the law. I mean, the uh, the decision says. I said the law is right now. It's deemed law. It was a district court judgment. It's deemed to be the decision. That, that there was pains taken to to, uh, to make sure that they missed everybody that they could. And it seems now, all of a sudden, everyone that doesn't quite realize they've all shifted over to what I've said. They've run on over. They've they've all agreed. Now we're just looking at the water. And yet, that's a that's a, a fictitious thing as well, as I think I'll, I'll touch on before I get there. Though, there was a in the contention that happened that we clarified a bit, though, but still came on about this. Uh, it maybe it's non-essential. It's really maybe a trivial matter, but it, I think it's it's one that's instructive for me at least to articulate. I hope it, it, because in a way it doesn't matter if we still don't agree. Uh, it really is incidental, but for the purpose of understanding law of the land, how this all works out, uh, in the concept of what the, the, uh, the contention we call the doorstep. I'll call it the doorstep. So what, while I take Vince's uh, exception to consider that the pipeline is at the doorstep of the reservation, or by way of the Missouri River, Misery River, the Missouri River, I don't whatever you want, to, whatever your dialect, um, despite the contention that it's still on the doorstep because of the river, I would still disagree. And I, what I want to remind you is what I said is that the of, of some of, of things, one of the more important points I was saying about this, the, the court's use of the term, I said the court's use of this term doorstep was unfortunate. And and my, my view on that was given that the water is a navigable river highway, and, and more so now, uh, being the property line unless meandered is the green line the vegetation line the river is not at the doorstep now i know i heard some contention possibly but this gets down to what i have to deal with in law and in the land and how we start dividing we start making a place for ourselves in order to understand better that i just want to accept this or not it's what i use i'll just put it that way that the court, instead of door doorstep, ought to have used the term adjacent. The Missouri River, known as a highway, it's a non, it's a non, it's a navigable highway. It's a highway. Just put that in your mind. Is adjacent, but the pipeline is not either at the doorstep. It's neither at the doorstep, and it's not adjacent. The river is adjacent. So I, I make these distinctions and why I say the doorstep was unfortunate because without a proper, uh, in dealing with this property stuff, it's important to correctly describe placement to provide better understanding 
CFO in the overall, which is one of my main problems. I, what the heck? How is this thing laid out that we're having all this trouble? And once I started to get more information in the maps, I could start seeing, okay, well, here's what's going on now. I see a little bit better picture. That word form description was unfortunate. For, for instance, if you just follow my, my thought here. Wow, time flies, doesn't it? Um, uh, I, I shouldn't even looked over at the clock uh, because of what flashed in my mind is all the, and I'm not saying this is really unimportant. I think the lessons I'm, I hope you're learning or hope I'm conveying about proper action is really important, but I, ho I wanted to really say this much. Do you realize you have a comment to make before the CDC to take away your right to be mobile when they decide you're sick? It's ongoing right now. The time is ticking and I've been wanting to get to that. But that's probably more important actually than the reality behind this pipeline. And I'll tell you, well, you can fight it. Go ahead and think you're protecting the water. When the government comes in and says that water's poisoning you and we're going to confine you, it's over. And you're going to let that process, while well, we're focused on this, that thing is going. So I just want to at least say that. But going back to, to this adjacent condition, identifying really where a doorstep might be with relation to property law and understanding what's going on. A property adjacent a highway. An eminent domain taking for expansion, taking out the front porch of a house for a public sidewalk, brought the highway to the doorstep of the property adjacent the highway. If you follow what I just said here. You have two places and there's a highway between and there's an eminent domain taking and they take the sidewalks right up to the front porches or take out the front porches of houses on either side. At that point, the highway is a literally at the doorstep. Before widening the highway, it was not at the doorstep of the house, but adjacent the property. The highway, the singular, the set, set certain property of the highway was adjacent another property, but not at any doorstep. So upon widening, the highway becomes literally at the doorstep. Similarly, given the floodwaters rise high enough to enter into the property here, you're trying to get a you got to put it in reality. You got to get on the land. I assume that the flood, the river Missouri floods at points, and it can enter into the property. It might then be considered that the highway is at the doorstep, literally flooding in. And this is the problem of the fluid highway. But follow the property prop part of this. That upon receding, the highway is again contained within the bed and bank, adjacent the tribal reserve reservation. So again, I want to remind you, I said that the use of the doorstep is unfortunate because it would bring a little bit to my mind, brought a little clarity to go back to what it really was doing and gets us into the point of this contention now that everyone's now seemingly not arguing about everything that was happening last week. Now they're all focused on, on uh, what is uh, the so-called high ground of protecting the water. And so what does that analysis of adjacent and uh, doorstep and all, like I said, it, that may be a menial, just a trivial thing, but it does get us to the water and how it interacts and what it's all about. And really, what is this water? How does this address the quality of the water itself? And what is right when claiming to protect it? It, it seems to me a, a, a reality shift problem. No contention that water needs to be protected and be pured where it's pure and protected, but this is, becomes the thing. This becomes the the the, the, the storyline and the assertion that the water in the highway river is fit for consumption by people is a grand fallacy. I have to deal with this all the time. And I know maybe some people would, but I mean, really, would you drink from the river directly? I know some people have, and I know they did, but actually when you find out the truth of it, would you really, do you, would you prefer another way? Uh, you probably wouldn't drink from that river. It's a highway of commerce. All right. Think about the highway, a highway that's not fluid. The highway of commerce, uh, in this case, along which there's a lot of development up the river. And this is, goes, this is a long river. And this is where we, again, the, we, we, I've got to separate the emotion-driven call that they've now immediately produced to try and take the high ground, which to me is a major fallacy, and it's what the UN is pushing that gets you away from doing what needs to be done to, to actually protect that thing. They get you to pretend something is something it's not. The emotional driven call to protect the water is a fallacy. 
and is driven by the principle behind the myth described in the assertion and belief that the water is ever pristine. You've heard that word pristine? They use it about everywhere they can get it. It's like the iconic rivers and the iconic salmon. They want to exalt these things beyond their, their actual status in law. As important as they are, they get uh, mischaracterized. This, this prist ever pristine consequence of water, wherever it is, is just a fallacy. And we can infer that this is a promotion by the people in their unsubstantiated uh, statements about the mere existence of the pipeline, just the mere existence of the pipeline and, and promoting this fallacy that if we don't stop it, it will poison our river. That was a quote I found in a r report. They're saying if we don't stop this pipeline, it will poison our river. As well, they say, when it leaks, which is unproven, it's a hypothetical claim with no bearing. And none was presented in the record for me to work with, or the court, if I was going to consider that. But to make these claims presumes this water is this, oh man, it's just coming out of the fresh driven snow glacier. Uh, folks, I, I've been into Mark Twain land twice. It was when those big floods came. We came in after the flood pretty close to after. We wanted to stop in to see if we could help while we were passing through. It was a cross-country trip. We did it once a year for a few years. It just happened to be coming through. It was major floods. But you know what? I went through. I wouldn't drink the, the water in those highways. Though I doubt the Mississippi River was ever considered pristine. This is not my point. My point is that's the fallacy they use to get you to believe that the Missouri is different and it's not. And so let's get the water quality pro thing straight before we start condemning a whole lot and making accusations that really can't be proven at this point. I mean, when I was down, remember, it's humid down there and where we were. You could, you could taste, taste the oppressive stench that was left by the river residues on everything. And this is the, this is the quality of the water you profess you are protecting? For those of you that claim that, I'm not saying it's not important. I'm telling you that I think you've been, you've been duped. There's another way at this. It's not the way you're going, but it is promoting uh, false conceptions and this control of water on an international level. So, as I said, I've had to deal with this pristine lie for years. It's it the first, one of the things they always throw out, these eco-terrorists. And, but I finally realized what the problem was. We get involved with these words, and you know, I mean, how do you how do you counter? Oh, you got to keep water fresh. I mean, it's real hard to, you know, they kind of jump on this high horse bandwagon. Like, the, yeah, how, why would you argue against that? So they made a good job of mischaracterizing things and and then giving them a, a a pretty face, and you we all buy into it because who who would want to who wants to speak what it sounds like to be contrary to fresh clean water? So be careful that you think I'm saying that because I'm certainly not. But when I, I finally realized how to kind of work this through, and it, it happened to be a, a really cool river that we have locally that I will tell you is the cleanest looking river I've really ever seen uh, around anywhere I've been. Uh, the color of the water is just unique. It's just beautiful. That that river has come under attack for production against production, and they named that river Pristine. And that's when I realized, even it, it is not as inviting as that, that body of water is, maybe even, you know, get in it and I'll swim around. I realized that uh, pristine doesn't mean potable or safe water to drink. And then I realized that pristine, again, was the trigger term, which who can fight against, which was really defeating us in just a term because we didn't have a better thought about it. We, as soon as we buy into the term as it is, sits as a reality when it's not, we've, been, we've lied to ourselves. And as applied to the, the assertion that the water protectors must protect the quality of the highway river, in my mind, that's another stalking horse. It's a facade designed to hide w w what should have actually taken place, which did not, or if it did, could not be found to be the right thing to do in balance. They didn't present the evidence to bring 
the balance that needed. And they can't because that water is not anywhere near to something protectable. It needs to be fixed. And this is where NEPA pops up. That balance is the NEPA requirement which the court found had been done but was not completed to the burden level that was upon the people asserting it. And there was nothing asserted, actually. Now, I'm going to assume something that I wouldn't do it, so I'm going to assume most people are reasonable. I suppose when you're in your dying day, I guess you would. I'm not saying that this would never happen. I'm saying we had, we, we had the awareness and the choice. We wouldn't drink along the, the side of the highway. We wouldn't drink the water along the side of any highway. Neither, I think, would you drink it from the highway itself, as in this case. Think of these in literal terms. This is what's going on in these areas. There's industry, production, transportation, social activity, uh, societal expansion and work going on on these rivers. It, it's not something I can change. It's something that we can fix. Well, we can fix it, but that, uh, well, I'm back to the uh, giant meteor, folks. That's how that'll fix it. But until then, or until we come up with a different thing, uh, I'm not going to drink the water by the highway. Just dip in and drink. It's not going to happen. And that, that, that uh, Missouri River is a highway. It just happens to be a liquid highway. It has all the same problems. Probably worse. So whether or not as we were, you know, the, the, whether or not it's at the doorstep is minimal. But the threat of the pipeline on which the, uh, is merely a contested interest of facts you also see Vince offering another element that built into this standard is one of risk. And these are the things I'm trying to show you have to put in, your cat in the categories of things that must be met. And this risk speaks to this competing interest that Vince identified right in his, in his paperwork, in his research. And it has to be acknowledged, nothing here, and there's nothing on earth is without some sort of risk and then NEPA requires that that risk is balanced against societal needs. Whether that be even environmental, environmental in its actual natural state, not the, not the, not the UN state, but the, but, but the real state, and what society demands. This is, we, the people ourselves, are demanding this. And so this brings up another concept that it, I, people take offense to that I won't bring up at any rate. We all in on it, I guess. I'll say it that way. So um, to me, I, I look at this, I, said, I would challenge any of y'all. Show me a surface water uh, in sufficient quantities, not needing processing of some sort. I mean, you know, processing so that it becomes drinkable to avoid ill effects. I don't know, really know of any surface water that to come up with this idea that we're protecting water while it is, it's not potable. As, even as the little little river that I'm talking about is clean and inviting as it is, is really um, an insult that we buy into that. Am I saying that I don't want clean water or don't want to protect water? No, but we have to we protect it from where it is now, not from our illusions of what we want that it's already there. And so we have additional little, I think a statement came up that comes up, I can, and I can hear some of this. Well, so, but that doesn't mean that we can add to the risk with another pipeline. And I understand. But this, this but, 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 but when you get to there, I have to say, and, and this is not to those that say F the legal system and F the process, because that's not going to do it. But to those who intend to make the difference here, I say, it is for you to prove the risk higher than can be mitigated as balanced against competing and evidence to show what is more right. I'm just restating a standard in NEPA. You have to bring the cause, folks. You can't sit around and complain about it. You can't not, not present it and then, to com then complain, complain about it. There And there is this process, and so whatever you want to call it, legal, lawful, statutory, uh, admiralty, administrative, whatever title you want to put on it, that's the tool that you use to assert your point. You can't denounce it. 
And what I'm speaking to is this process where you move your opinion of what is right into action. And, I, and another thing I've noticed popping up uh, is the walking wounded thing. Um, boy, oh boy. Far, that's far better here to do it that I'm suggesting than acting like the victim, hiding under a derelict sovereignty, playing games, and not willing to do, do what's right and participate. The proper way, folks. This is what the, the standing Sioux, you read the, art, the decision in the, in the, in the judge's order, the, the, there was games being played by the standing Sioux that they did not actually engage what they should have engaged. And when they came to the table with their stuff, it wasn't even relevant to the project. So I'm suggesting we do it proper and we get what's right instead of asserting as an opinion what we think is right and stop acting as renegade crickets. Pause in here. Do you understand what I, did you, did you get what I'm saying? The crickets are those that don't do it right. Their, their action is silence before the reality of what has to happen. And I guess that's my a little bit of my disappointment that I I mean another week gets passed and things are going on and whether or not I mean in some regard I can't see the totality of the point where where the Indians have bigger problems and they may roll into this one but but not this one not on its own not with what I've seen I mean they talk about treaty and it really is not relevant but you look in the treaty and you see some very interesting things. If people read the treaty, the Indians understood what the treaty said. There's some provisions inside there that within the reservation gets them outside the reser out to, to work outside the reservation. It, it's fascinating. In fact, in the treaty, I had never at least the way I interpret it, I had never seen a patent to a tenancy at will. And yet the 1868 treaty provides a patent I don't get that yet. I'm still working on it. A patent for a tenancy at will. Fascinating. Well, it's fascinating to me having to work through it. Uh, maybe those of you don't, don't hear it. but uh, So the treaties have things in them. I don't disregard any of it. But again, they were not relevant to this matter, which I was a little bit surprised. But no, it's okay. It's not. I, don't, I have nothing more to say. If, I, if my observation of that's wrong and, and maybe the treaty was enforced and then it wasn't put in the record, that's an appealable issue if it's relevant to the outcome. And looking over things at this point, I'm not so sure. And so this was a, an opportunity for uh, people to get all rally up around. And uh, like I said, they said the non-fuel, uh, fossil fuel interests come and took over the Indians' uh, cause. And I asked you, could they? I was, uh, and I don't, and I take this, I'm not making accusatory, and I just took it generally, that I was making generalized assumptions on a lot of things. And my question to that was a question. It wasn't taking, I said, no, I'm looking at the rules and the facts. The facts I want to know is where's the, Where's the, uh, the, the, uh, the, tr the treaties grant the mineral estate? Where's the treaties do this? Where off the treaties is this? What is this? I want to know certain things that are provable. I'm not really working from any assumptions. In fact, I try to, we sit in the presumptions because those are what we have to look at in doing things right or better. There's presumptions. Burdens are the presumptions. That you can't. You have to overcome that. Why? Because it weeds out the fraudsters, the, the, hy the hypotheticals, the hyperbola. And I'm not talking an absolute utopia here, perfection. I'm just saying that this is just the process that allows us to do that. That you will have to you do that wherever you go and to denounce it as a, as a, you know, get rid of this legal stuff. Okay, you can put the mischaracterize that po on this point, but you're destroying how we go about making things more right. And, and so who's to blame when we, having the obligation, didn't do that for ourselves? And who is the peanut gallery looking on to say, to fight, that, no, we want to assert what that guy's right is. When they haven't, and they haven't chosen to. That's, I'm putting my will on someone else, and their judgment, or their better judgment. Much better to educate and let them make that decision. Why I was thinking, you know, if what Vince was saying about this, these maintenance contracts, that would be a 
a very important piece of knowledge for the tribes to tell the property owners did you did you did you find did, did you get that in your contract and if you didn't maybe you got to re, redo that contract so that you're not held liable to this and maybe just that little thing would have put enough question on the property owners that all the ones that agreed may not have agreed And we see evidence that that's possible in a thing that Gary L. brought up. But first, before I get to that, someone did stop a pipeline. I'll buy them lonesome. So this is giving credence to what I'm telling you. Within your power, within your rights, you have power. There's provisions and in, in process to, in order to get that to, do, to be going on. You, you have to wield that, though, for yourself. It's an action thing. Uh, what I want to get on these treaties is very interesting, something I just learned. Uh, I didn't realize it. I told you this before. I just want to get to the point of reading it uh, so that you hear it. Uh, in the United States, the term treaty is used in more restrictive legal sense than in international law. The United States law distinguishes what it calls treaties from congressional executive agreements and sole executive agreements. You have congressional executive agreements and sole executive agreements that are also considered treaties. They're in classes of treaties. They're all considered a treaty, though, under international law. And so this was very interesting because then I realized that the patent, why I've been saying the patent that you have as a treaty is because it ends up being one of these, but it's not, a, it's not ratified by, by the Senate. Well, it is in a way. In the enactment of the law, they give their first ratification uh, to that agreement to convey the land, and the president seals it. Those are, that's the, that's the, the, the Senate agreement, and, the, and then this becomes the presidential fulfillment. So you can see it that way. But this way says that a congressional executive agreement or a sole executive agreement can be issued to be a patent. This seems to be what the, the, the sole executive agreement seems to be what the Treaty of 1868 might be. So it's a treaty but it's a very particular one. And so I found this, I wanted to convey that, very interesting, there's more to read. I'm just simply just reading off of a wiki, uh, just to get a, a general overview, quick, I don't know, like I said, I don't have all the time to dig deep. If I was focused on a treaty, you know, I'd be reading a whole lot more than wiki, but for right now in our purposes, we can see that we have to place every document in, a, in, a, in the, in the pl proper authority. And I found that pretty interesting. The other thing I found easy, interesting was also researching, when I came actually for, to treaty from treaty clause, was this little bitty sentence talking about treaties and indigenous people. And uh, I said, that's us, right here. This is what we are. This is what we do. This is how it works. This is the example of where it was done before, just like I've been telling you. And they call it the rare case. And what this is, uh, treaties were formed, as this starts out, an important part of European colonization. And in many parts of the world, Europeans attempted to legitimize their sovereignty by signing treaties with indigenous peoples. In most cases, these treaties were in, in extremely in disadvantageous terms to the native people, who often did not appreciate the implications of what they were signing. And I'm not denying any of that in what I'm telling you here at all. I'm just saying there's a process that you're in. Use it and use it to its fulfillment. Now, here's the next part that really drove it home. What I've been saying, when you find yourself inside the prison, what's your tools level? You're in the battlefield naked. What do you, what's your first action? What's your second action? How do you prevail in that condition? In rare cases... To combat this European colonization, and don't think I'm talking about just the native peoples here. We all on the res, folks. You, Russell Means told that. He, when, he, when he acknowledged that, he just confirmed everything I told you. We live in the open-air prison. All of us. And yet we have process that we can move through. I'm talking in the, in the least of it, folks. We have this process. I'm not, do you think I always believe we all we always in that in that prison? Well, no, I've seen another way too, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when we find ourselves in a position that we have to respond, we have to respond correctly. In rare cases, to combat this European colonization, in places such as Ethiopia and the Qing Dynasty in China, in Ethiopia and China, not the US, not in England, nowhere else, 
In rare cases, in these two foreign places, the local governments were able to use the treaties to at least mitigate the impact of European colonization. Listen, this is where it was. This involved learning the intricacies of European diplomatic customs and then using the treaties to prevent a power from overstepping their agreement or by playing different powers against each other. Did you hear the word diplomatic as relating to a treaty now, folks? Did you hear you learn how you, you communicate in order to affect the power that's in the treaty? And you then the play that you're doing is one power against the other. As I've told you, you get the agencies fighting amongst each other. You don't play the game of not being diplomatic or being, uh, oh, I'm also sovereign, you've got to do bow to my will. The process of how you limited the colonization of yourselves everywhere is you engage, the local government is you, the mining district, the people, the tribe, the, the reservation creating the government, or the tribe creating the government on the reservation, its territory. And you, involve, you learn the intricacies of the diplomatic customs and then use those powers, those laws, to prevent that power from overstepping their agreement. Is what I have been telling you in this little wiki thing. It's near the bottom. I mean, I'm not going to read. There's so much to read there. I didn't even, I found that totally in line. Again, I'm just always trying to make sure that I'm um, on the right path for myself and that I'm telling you, I'm showing you the right path. In this stocking horse idea that now, he, I, as I can conceive, just notional things, uh, conjectural things like pristine water is, the st is another style stocking horse. And I said this was a presentation on the universal, on the global stage, utilizing the, the, the indigenous peoples through a foreign imposition and as foreign intricacy, not understood yet, as I can tell. We see another story come out right after this showing, I think, exactly what I've been telling you. This is a celebrity. This rises up to a show for the world on the world stage being used by the globalist and their, and their spokespersons. Leonardo DiCaprio stands with the Great Sioux Nation to stop Dakota Access Pipeline. Now, isn't it great that someone stands with you? And this is, the, this is how they lull you into believing that they're doing good for you. And over the week, I still haven't found a, a, an error in my observation at this point in my, uh, my, uh, and my look at what my, the, the basis by which I'm coming to, sit, to say what I say and to make sure that if we see, to, to, see, to see that so we can protect ourselves better. That this little thing pops up and he wants to say he's going to talk about it. And when you listen to what the, he's actually doing, he's actually promoting a new movie. And so he comes in with a triumphant noble cause. I'm standing with the great Sioux Nation to protect their water and lands. The lands, in this case of this project, are not under threat. The water is not actually under threat. And if it was, the tribes failed to produce the actual threat. That this is the meme and the myth that they've been bringing on from the external, the global side. That they're utilizing these causes that I think will defeat all of us. Why? Because you hand the answer to them, they make the wrong answer to get the answer they wanted. You saw that evidence come out of the United States government, coming out contrary to the judges finding that the process was completed and there was nothing going on, and no further findings that that was actually the fault, and, the pro and there was no fault or problem. So the celebrity hits the stage. But what is he driving home? He's driving home an appearance that he's standing with you, but he's a, 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 a you, the, the native people, the Indians. But he's promoting a film and he's doing an agenda. He's advancing the agenda. And almost right on cue, and certainly I can't prove this, that's conjecture to say on cue like it was planned, but you know, you see these things. As a warning, like uh, there's legitimacy about the threat of these pipelines, and granted, there are some problems, but then you hear Vince talk, maybe these things are avoidable. We don't know because we haven't had the insight that Vince just gave us on his broadcast about the bedding of the pipe, the contract, the maintenance, who's responsible, when's it get done? 
These things are not laid out. They're passed by the attorneys who are running the agenda. And we, not being so wise about that, not told about it, are clueless until the disaster does hit. And then they come in and say, see, we get to use that against you again. And you get to use that against these other people. And while you guys are fighting, we're going to go do something else. That right on cue, Alabama, uh, the, 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 the news is about Alabama, um, Alabama pipeline um, spill, now, gasoline flows uh, over a, th a third of a, a th third of a million gallons. At this at this report, it was 250 a quarter million gallons of gas blue is leaking out of a, a pipe. Right on cue, it seemed to me. What I found interesting about this story is, uh, you see what they could be demanded. The company got right on this. And I'm not saying I agree that there should be gasoline everywhere. What I'm saying is that we have risks, we have activity, there's competing demands. They built the pipe to a, spe a specific standard. If you don't like the standard, you've got to go talk to the agency that does the certification, of, and you've got to put in your science and your studies, and you've got to get that changed. But in this case, you see what they do. And I can't believe that uh, just a company wants 250,000 to 300,000 gallons of gasoline on the ground. That's over a million dollars in value to somebody that's on the ground and at cost now. I can't believe the companies out there, the big bad companies out there to do that to y'all. Yet it breaks right on cue, in my mind, and yet they come and they tell you what they do around this. It's near a river system. It's actually in a river a wildlife management area. Wow, all the, cue, all the triggers, folks. Wildlife management area. But you know when you read this story that they've taken great uh, efforts to make sure that if case that risk were to happen, that they could respond. And I guess this is the point. The, the mitigation part is also built in a response. And they said uh, there is no concern. And I know people go, oh, yeah, there's no concern. Well, we do have polluted land. That's a concern. I'll go, I won't, I'll go that much. But regarding this thing spreading around and, uh, oh, this is just a pollution that they just disregard, uh, there, and they didn't plan for it. There is no concern that we will lose containment from what we call pond number two. So first pond's taking it up, second pond sitting there in resort in re reserve. If there for some reason we do lose containment, now that was a question to me. Why would they lose containment? But in case they have pond two lose uh, loss, uh, th there's also pond three, and it's got containment built into it, and there's multiple containment areas on the Peel Creek all before it gets the, to the Cahuba, to Cahaba River. He explained that all three ponds were already in place near the leak as a result of some mining activity and that they were being used to contain as, as containment ponds because they were uh, suited uh, for the task. Okay, so we do have a spill, we do have a containment. Risk happens, it's spilled on the ground, but we've taken measures to keep it from being a harm. Did the process, uh, did, the, did the tribe insist on these types of levels of mitigation containment? I don't know. I'm just saying, here's a story right on cue to make pipelines a threat, and yet right in the story you see in the balance of what the society needs versus um, other things like fresh water, we see there is things you can demand are done in order to mitigate the impact, just like that treaty decision said. Just like that treaty clause uh, uh, wiki said. Pretty fascinating in some regard. And then, based on this balance of risks and society's needs, we, interesting story. This is a whole lot less on cue. This is an interesting coincidence, but it ex explains an interesting thing, which I may have been hearing miss at least by this story, misreported uh, that a massive sinkhole contaminates Florida aquifer was that I heard, uh, if I heard correctly, a few people were saying this company was pumping radioactive fertilizer waste into the aquifer, when in fact what happened was these, uh, what, they, what they call uh, stacks of a byproduct for making fertilizer it developed a sinkhole underneath and cracked the lining, which caused the liquid in the vat to leak into an aquifer they're using now and pumping from to process the fertilizer. 
So this isn't them pumping into the aquifer of Florida. This was a um, one of those risk things, uh, almost almost unforeseeable. Although in in Florida, I think I don't know how you can not foresee sinkholes. It's just a what, what's the what's the height of Florida? The, the biggest mountain in Florida is what 22 feet, and that's if an alligator's laying on the mound. I mean, this stuff is this is a Florida Florida uh, Florida. It's Florida is what it is. It's a floating out there. There's not much distance between the the land and the water table. So they got some some serious problems there as well. But here's what I picked up on. You read this story. The the company's all over this. They're not pumping radioactive material into the pond. They're, they're trying to contain it. They've got other ponds, other places, other containment. They now know they have a sinkhole problem, I suppose. But what was interesting was that the EPA is all over this. They're with the EPA. They're looking all over this stuff. It's a The product is a phosphogypsum waste product. It has a... Um, because of the way the natural minerals are, it's another natural mineral byproduct of, of radi natural radiation, that it is slightly radioactive. And the EPA has done their checks and found out that if you have such a con certain concentration, it is something you don't want to breathe. But it's so, way far less, if you look at the fact of it, than a smoker gets every day, uh, smoking two packs of cigarettes. Way, I mean way, not even close. Uh, interesting story about the phosphogypsum. I never heard it before. It's just a mineral, right? But it's, it's radioactive. Hey, oh, at that point, I say, Logan Hawks at UCY, maybe look into this on your little battery thing. Maybe. They got tons of this stuff they got to get rid of. Maybe there's a use for what you do. That they are taking great steps to try and mitigate. Never really uh, understood up until just of last few years the importance of the, of the lack of fertilizer in the world. That uh, This is one of those interesting competing interests. If you stop the production of this uh, uh, gly uh, phospho, uh, what was it, um, phosphogypsum, phosphogypsum, uh, and you stop producing fertilizer, you all gonna die, folks. You all gonna die. The fertile the plants aren't gonna grow. You're not gonna get anything to eat, and you're gonna die. So, what's your competing interest balance for that in the face of this thing going on, where we do see? radioactive dust, uh, uh, powder, um, water actually, uh, going into an aquifer, which is a recycling aquifer. Uh, we have decisions to make in this complex society that in this case, if we don't do fertilizer, we may not eat. And so here's the risk. And so our, uh, the op option is that we get smarter and more intelligent on how we deal with that risk which feeds back into what I was saying about when you have better facts to show a better system Find the alternative to what's existing if you're afraid of what they're doing now. Change it, finding the, 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 the observation. Then you have the power through the process to, to put that in. Not doing that, and you're going to see, see whatever the other side is doing that is the one I'm telling you is coming against you, which is these, the system that uses the Indians and the people and their cause, even attorneys over private property rights, and they destroy the people and their private property rights uh, for the most part. And I'm saying that they do that even when the wind, when I've told you before, the winds are wrong because they're under administrative control and land disposal, soil disposal in the country, United States, is not subject to agency control. So you see a diminishment and destruction of the ultimate right. I'll have a link in the broadcaster to Russell Means. Welcome to the reservation. So I didn't get to more talk about that. Uh, Kira sent me the Indian Reorganization Act where I say together we see the peoples of, the, uh, of all time from 33 today are still suffering under federal mismanagement of lands and we cannot get sustained yield to pr production out and because of that we're going to all burn to death. Uh, conflagration uh, classification here when the forests go to fire. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Hope I uh, offered a whole lot more clarity on getting involved in how to. Uh, not in uh, not in contention really with a lot of what I heard. Just m my my side is a better. Uh, I hope is to offer the better way to do so that you do assert what is right. In this case, it has to be more right with competing interests. So thank you for tuning in today. Uh, thank you to Grimner and the website and RLMRealLibertyMedia.com and the contribution with him and Bo Diddy for the social network. Um, uh, and I just forgot it. Jeez, I got so much going on. Uh, freedomsnetwork.com and then UCY Jules thank you very much uh, for the for the broadcast uh, simulcast and then the pre and the past casts and Vince thank you very much for your